Hello again. Welcome back. This is part three of a five video um, set on glass in its various aspects. Glass is an absolutely wonderful material, uh, quite ubiquitous in fact in modern life. In the first two videos we've looked a little bit about uh, into the science of glass, how it's made, um, what makes a glass a glass in fact, and we focused on the arrangement of atoms within it. We looked at which elements and compounds one can use to make a glass, how we might modify it, lowering its melting point, that sort of thing. Um, and today I'd like to move on, and I'd like to move on as our title slide might suggest, to the use of glass in stained glass windows, and in fact in architecture uh, in general, and there's a couple of other uh, pictures that I'll show you on the way through. Um, as I said at the end of the um, second video, this is one of the windows in the cathedral in Strasbourg. Uh, it's a picture I took a few years ago. It's a rather attractive window, I think, but being based in Canterbury and this being uh, video course material essentially for my local branch of the University of the Third Age, you won't be terribly surprised if a lot of the glass that I show you during this uh, section of the of the video series um, is based on uh, Canterbury Cathedral and other buildings in fact in and around Canterbury. So let's dive in and see what we can find. So this time around uh, we're going to be looking at technology and art, essentially, so staining and painting, the use of glass in sculpture, uh, and indeed in, in other aspects of our, uh, of our modern culture. And once again, as my green screen background, I've got a piece of glass artwork by local artist Grace Ason, um, based in Kent, in Ramsgate, in fact, where her studio is. This is another of her light boxes series uh, and you can find all the information you might need about this and other pieces of her work by visiting her website. So let's um, let's move on. Colouring. Colouring glass is a really important aspect of glass art as you'll appreciate uh, and in fact we can follow the progress of chemistry really, or at least metals chemistry, by looking at the different colours that were introduced in glass through history. And the reason we can do that is that within a decade, in most, most cases, of a metal oxide being isolated, so nickel oxide, copper oxide, whatever, uh, we'll find it popping up in a new colour of glass that's being used decoratively um, in a window somewhere or in glassware of, of other sorts. Uh, now these tables come from um, uh, Pilkington, the UK glass company, and it's just a list really of, of the metals from which different colours come. There's a lot of information on here, it doesn't really matter, I'm going to show you some examples of these uh, as, we, um, as we progress. Um, but as you can see, whatever metal we put in, we end up with a different colour. Some metals actually give the same sort of colouring as, as some others. So for instance, we can get a blue from cobalt and from copper and in fact from thulium if we wanted to. Uh, even some forms of iron, depending on its state, uh, can give us a blue coloured glass. There's another list I've got here. This was simply taken off uh, a website, the address, as in a lot of the material that I've sourced online uh, is shown on the screen there. But again, different metals in one compound or another, it actually doesn't really matter what the compound is, it's the metal that's important, uh, and the colours that they produce. And including these ones down here, manganese and sodium, 
which actually can um, take colouring out of a glass. So these things became very important technologically in terms of producing a clear transparent glass in the early days before um, having pure materials and therefore no contaminants in the batch stock was easily achievable. But I think we should break off now and perhaps have a look at some examples uh, of this. So let's switch cameras and, and have a look at what we've got. So we can have a look for, for instance here, this very pale blue example um, contains a low concentration of cobalt. If we increase the cobalt concentration you can see we get a much richer colour, uh, a very dark blue. Um, don't worry about this um, dark circle in the middle. Uh, I have a confession to make at this point. I, um, I burnt the glass with an x-ray beam some years ago um, and that's where that dark colouring comes from. But you can see that we can tune the saturation of the colour simply by changing the concentration of metal uh, in our glass stock. If we add nickel then we get something slightly different. This is a sort of um, yellowy brown colour I suppose uh, it would seem here. Um, vanadium, another metal, this gives us a really lovely pale green. Uh, if we want a darker green we can actually um, try a low concentration of iron which is what this one is. If we increase the iron concentration we actually get uh, we actually get this colour. Uh, it turns into um, or turns from, I should say, a pale greeny blue into a very dark, uh, deep and rich colour over here. The one next to it, you'll notice x-ray damage again, but this is a piece of glass um, that's had, it, um, had selenium added to it. And you'll see that it's a, uh, at least I hope you can see, it's a very delicate pink colour. Um, I'm not sure that it helps if I hold it close to the camera or not. Uh, but if you can't see it, please take my word for it. Um, we have a different shade of blue over here. This comes from putting copper in this glass. Now, the interesting thing is, and it's actually quite difficult to demonstrate here, I'm afraid, so my apologies in advance. But if we added both copper and iron to a glass, for instance, uh, we'd end up with a different colour again. Um, now, it's, I'm not sure you can make it out uh, in this, uh, but it is a slightly different colour to either. So we're adding two different metals into this mix, for instance. If we had copper and nickel, then likewise, um, putting the two in together gives us a different colour to either on their own. So we can play all sorts of tricks with adding metals to glass just to produce the colour and obviously for um, uh, stained glass windows for you know lots of architectural artistic glassware um, and even for coloured bottles and so on this is actually an extremely um, useful piece of knowledge to have and as I say the development of these colours followed pretty precisely the develop uh, development of um, the chemistry of metals um, through history. So let's go back to our slides again and we'll take this a little bit further. So now let's have a look at this coloured glass as it's used uh, in artwork for instance. So the chap we can see on the left of the screen is a really very very famous glass um, artist called Dale Chihuly. Um, who um, worked in Chicago, um, has a really large studio there, lots and lots of people working for him. Uh, and one of his really large um, glass art installations is shown behind him here. Um, this is another of his, this is called Fern Green Tower. Each of these pieces is a separate blown um, piece of uh, piece of glass and these blown pieces are stacked to produce this final sculptural shape. Um, 
you can see an example of this. There are several of these fern green towers in, in different forms and shapes and sizes. But there's a really rather um, beautiful example in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, if you, um, if you ever get the chance to um, go and have a look, as well as a lot of other works by Dale Chihuly and many, many other um, glass artists. It's well worth visiting. Uh, next to it, we've got an example of, of Venetian glass. Uh, we mentioned the development of, of uh, Venetian glassware in um, the first video in the series. Uh, this is a piece called Emergence. Um, I've got my own piece of Venetian glass from a visit recently. Um, it's a very small and modest piece because, I have to be honest with you, I couldn't um, justify spending large amounts of money on anything bigger and Venetian glass is extremely expensive. Um, but I rather like this piece. It sort of reminded me a little bit of um, electron orbitals around um, the nuclei of atoms and so on. So there's a bit of a sort of nerdy interest as well as an artistic interest. Uh, but moving on, um, this stained glass panel here was actually made by um, um, Tiffany um, in the United States. This is a piece actually in the um, Chicago Museum of Art. Very, very beautiful piece of um, stained glass artwork. Uh, Tiffany is quite famous actually for the work that he did with glass and, um, you know, a lot of glass lampshades, for instance made with coloured glass that he put together. Um, and up above here we've got something that's uh, distinctly different. Um, this is a, um, a model of the head of Aminotep II. Um, and this particular pharaoh uh, wanted his features immortalised in glass. Now this thing isn't very big, it's, it's in the British Museum should you want to go and see it. Uh, but it's perhaps five centimeters from top to bottom uh, and originally it would have been um, a sort of blue green glass but it's been kicking around in the desert for um, three three and a half thousand years so it's picked up a bit of surface contamination but you can see even so that the features that were originally in this piece of, um, of glass are still remarkably well preserved they're very well delineated uh, it hasn't changed shape or form um, other than that surface contamination colouring. Uh, and this is, I suppose, a good point. Again, it's a bit of a, um, a side issue. It's a tangent to the talk in general. But this illustrates why it is that so many people are putting a lot of effort and research into trying to... Um, capture nuclear waste within uh, a glass. So actually putting the nuclear material as a component in a glass block uh, because it is a material that we know will last for a very, very long time. Um, as I say, that was a digression. We're, we're, we're supposed to be looking at glass uh, being used in art at the moment. So these are just a few examples of many, 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 many things that I could have put uh, in this video but didn't. Just to illustrate um, I, what for me is the um, quintessential beauty uh, of this material in terms of its effects on light and, and therefore its visual appeal. We've seen this picture before. This was in the previous um, video. It was a um, an image from the Middle Ages of producing raw materials uh, and their preparation through to glass blowing. Um, and of course, you know, that's a process that's continued. And I illustrated that in the first film. Fashions change and the way we heat furnaces has changed and so on. But actually, glass blowing is still pretty much what glass blowing ever was. Um, and this fragment here, for instance, is uh, actually from a Victorian bottle, but it was found at the um, wreckage site of the Mary Rose. Uh, 
um, of um, Portsmouth, uh, hence the catalogue number down here, the MR stands for Mary Rose. And it's an illustration, I suppose, if nothing else, of some of the confusion that can come in when, um, you know, when dealing with uh, maritime archaeological sites, because, you know, things got thrown into the Solent uh, over the centuries after the Mary Rose sank. Uh, and this bottle was one of them. But you'll notice one of the things uh, very apparent here is that we've got this flaking of surface layers. Uh, and if you look at old glass in general, you can very often see this process taking place. And it, it can take place simply from um, water vapour in the air or uh, certainly from the acidic components of that. So when we start getting uh, pollution or even just carbon dioxide uh, incorporated, we can get chemical reactions taking place at the surface. Um, and some of this old glass really isn't as chemically stable as modern glass. Um, and, you know, we start getting layers coming off. And there are a lot of museum pieces around the world that are quite literally uh, peeling from the outside in and losing their, uh, losing material, losing their integrity. So let's come into stained glass proper. Uh, now this is um, from the uh, Beanie Institute in Canterbury, part of Canterbury Museums and Galleries. Uh, and there are several stained glass panels in there. Um, some of the biggest ones on the stairwell, if uh, you go in and have a look. And they are visually quite appealing, uh, but actually they're not and never were designed as entire stained glass windows. Uh, these panels are all made of fragments of Flemish glass, so collected actually, um, you know, back in the um, 1600s um, by a Kentish businessman. In fact, he came from, from Deal. All this information is on the museum's website. You can go and look it up. Uh, but he bought up all this Flemish glass that was coming out of um, decommissioned churches and so on. Um, and then the fragments were put together to make what are, I think, quite pleasing panels. And you can see the uh, Low Countries influence here. Here's um, a panel depicting a tulip flower. And as you will probably know, tulips at one stage were um, enormously valuable uh, and so why wouldn't they be enshrined in, in glass panels of this sort. So here's the full thing here and all I've done is take out that rectangle at the bottom and shown you, uh, shown you the thing in, in more detail. So rather pretty I think um, but we've not nearly finished on stained glass yet. Here's another panel again uh, from the um, from the Beanie Institute in Canterbury and just showing heads basically uh, monks, nuns, um, noblemen, um, all different fragments from different windows um, and all stitched together now to make these um, these very attractive decorative panels. But let's move to the cathedral. Um, this is the um, uh, one of the uh, great windows in the cathedral. I think this is the great north window. Um, but don't quote me on that. So view from the outside, view of the same thing from the inside. Uh, and you see the immediate difference, of course. I mean, from the outside, uh, there's really not a lot to see. Uh, you can pick out the... Um, the lead work in there uh, that's holding the panels together and you can see these cross pieces which are actually made of iron these are the things that are holding uh, the whole thing together uh, this iron frame is um, referred to as the ferramenta and the um, stained glass panels are actually attached to that and they are uh, the uh, the ferramenta they are what is used then to attach the whole thing into the masonry framework of the building. 
but come inside so we're now looking at light being transmitted through the glass and you can see immediately uh, the transformation and that we've got these astonishing colorful um, windows here which all tell a message all tell a story uh, if you know how to read it um, and not surprisingly uh, it will give you an indication of how the people of the time uh, were interpreting um, interpreting their faith but let's have a look in uh, uh, more detail uh, this is the I think the south oculus window um, and it gives you a a scale I suppose I mean this thing is is I don't know how high above the ground but you really have to crane your neck to see this um, from um, the nave of the church below but if I show you one of the panels of this window this one here in fact uh, that's been lifted out for study and for conservation work uh, next to you know a British standard um, workman here and you'll now not be surprised when I tell you that this window is is a full four meters uh, in diameter. It's absolutely huge. Uh, and I've been privileged over the year uh, years to go um, up into the galleries and, and you know see these things close up. It really has been quite a privilege. Uh, but they've been measured, studied uh, in great detail over time because of course some of them go back to the Middle Ages and they require constant attention and, um, uh, and repair. And this gives you a good view also, I think, of the ferramenta. There's an entire iron framework look that goes round each of the panels. And then even within that, uh, we get these iron bars that are actually holding the thing structurally and, and pinning it to the masonry around it. Um, and as it says down here, I'm immensely grateful to Leonie Seliger, who's the current head of the Cathedral Glass Studios. Leonie and I have worked together uh, off and on over several years. Um, and that itself has been quite a privilege, but it does mean now that I get, uh, by her kind permission, lots of these wonderful images to be able to put in this talk. And I mentioned conservation. Uh, one doesn't see it from ground level, as it were, but take one of these windows out and you can see immediately what the issues are. There's all sorts of um, material deposited on the surface as a sort of crusting. Uh, the lead and the solder joints will give way eventually. Um, and so there's painstaking restoration work. This is every bit as detailed and painstaking as uh, the conservation of, a, of, a, of an artwork, of a piece of, um, of fine art, a painting. Um, it occurs on the same scale, requires the same sort of level of expertise and training. But it also, I think, in this picture illustrates another important point. Stained glass windows are not just coloured glass. The coloured glass provides a background, as it were, uh, but actually the, the detail um, is painted on. Uh, these really are um, glass paintings uh, and worthy of the title of art. And you can see, you know, down here, for instance, the veins on this leaf and so on. They have all been picked out uh, with paint. And this can be applied in, in various ways. I mean, the two key ways um, would be to uh, paint for instance uh, a metal oxide onto the surface as a colour and then put the piece of glass into an oven and heat it up so that paint then fuses into the surface of the glass it's there forever essentially uh, it's been incorporated into the surface layers of the glass but one can also cold paint a piece of glass so essentially painting onto the surface um, and it stays there as a dried paint uh, thereafter until of course over a period of time uh, it might start peeling off or degrading in some other way uh, and requiring conservation. Um, 
so you know this is um, this is an amazing piece of work that these people do uh, on a rolling basis as well as being commissioned of course to produce um, new works of art new windows not just for Canterbury Cathedral but you know around the world in fact so this is one of the privileged visits that I was able to make um, this um, is one of the first major windows to be uh, renovated during the ongoing process of, of renovating and conserving the cathedral as a whole uh, at the moment. Uh, this one is first, I can tell you, you can, again you can find it on the cathedral's website, this one is first because a large piece of masonry simply fell off the outside of this window. Now thankfully no one was no one was injured, no one was hurt, uh, but it became then the obvious candidate uh, for the Masons and then for the glass conservation team. So every single one of these panels had been taken out, conserved, re-leaded where necessary, uh, and then set back into the new masonry of this, uh, this window. Um, and a few of us got permission to climb up onto the scaffolding to have a look at this close up. So you're seeing one of the pictures I took from the uh, from the scaffolding, and you can see it's been um, it's been cleaned. Uh, it's lovely and bright and shiny with the light coming through, and of course the new masonry on the outside adds to that as well. But let's take a look close up. This is just a part of it, and it illustrates how uh, these things are. Put together. So I mentioned that it's uh, an iron framework that's attached to the masonry and the windows are then attached to the iron framework to the ferramenta. So uh, here we can see one of the glass panels. Here's the iron rod and it goes across and into the masonry and against that is laid our stained glass panel and this is a fairly old panel um, not the oldest in the cathedral. I, I'm, um, you know, there's a lot from Victorian times as well as medieval times, uh, and in fact, some modern pieces as well. But you'll notice that um, if we look at this enlargement, so we take this section and move it over here, um, attached to the lead tracing that's holding the stained glass together. With its painting, look, lots of detail has been put in um, by uh, paintwork. Um, so this copper wire has been soldered to a piece of the lead. And it then wraps around the ferramenta and is twisted off. And that's how the stained glass uh, window panels are then held to their metal frames, which are then held in their turn uh, into the surrounding masonry. So if you've ever wondered how you can get these giant leaded glass windows um, surviving storms and rain and all sorts of other things uh, for centuries, uh, this is the way it's done. It's actually all held back to this very rigid iron frame. And here's a finished article. I moved a bit further along the window to where they were more advanced. So here's our copper ties that have been soldered to the lead behind in the window. And they've just been twisted off and laid flat to the iron so that you won't be able to see it from the ground floor, from the aisle of the church at all. So that's how, um, that's how these stained glass panels are put up. So some of the bits and pieces you can see, just to reiterate, uh, are just coloured glass. They've been a bit, you know, battered with weathering over the years, but they are basically coloured glass. But then we'll also get paintwork. So here's surface painted detail. There's some more down here in this lettering, um, and that will be creating for us uh, delineating the detail uh, in our stained glass image. Now this is quite an interesting one, this will put you to the test. A um, few years ago some of the oldest pieces of glass from the cathedral, the oldest windows rather, uh, went to the United States on tour 
um, and um, it was called I think the Ancestors Tour. Uh, it was looking at windows depicting the ancestors of Christ, so it went all the way back to, to Adam. Um, and it was displayed in various locations in the United States. But one of the things that the glass studios at the cathedral did was to make a modern replica of one of these medieval windows and just put them on display side by side with identical backlighting. Now, one of these is uh, medieval, one of them is the modern replica. Can you tell the difference? Would you go for this one as modern or this one as modern? Well, let's have a look. There's another piece of evidence here. You know, you're look, the, the light is coming through this window panel here and creating patterns of light down on the floor. Whereas we get no patterning on the floor through this one. And yet this one looks brighter to look at it with its backlighting. The backlighting, remember, is identical in both cases. And this illustrates a really important point. This is the modern one. This is the up-to-date replica. And it's bright, clean glass sending through shafts of now coloured light. Whereas this one is medieval. It's got a lot of surface contamination. Its surface has been pitted and roughened. There are things from atmospheric pollution that have been deposited onto it that couldn't easily be cleaned off during restoration. And of course, one doesn't want to damage the article by getting aggressive with the cleaning. So what happens is that the light comes in from behind this one and the roughened and um, contaminated surface actually scatters the light out in all directions. So it doesn't come straight through and land on the floor in pretty patterns. It actually gets sprayed out in all directions. So we see this apparently really bright, colourful glass window um, instead of getting light down on the floor in the pattern. So a modern stained glass window will tend to throw coloured light down uh, to where the, the sunlight's heading. An old one won't. Um, and that's quite telling. So go back to the Middle Ages when the cathedral was young, uh, you know, in the um, 13th, 14th century, say, and we'd have seen something much more like this. The cathedral inside would have been filled with patches of coloured light as the light came in through these stained glass windows. Whereas now we go in there, we don't see this stuff on the floor by and large. What we see is a very bright stained glass window. Um, that's a rather nice curiosity, I think. But we can show another example of that. This is one of the modern uh, stained glass windows uh, in the cathedral. Uh, here's um, Leonie um, here, the head of the studio, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and Laura, one of the other people who work there. And you can see immediately that we've got these incredible shafts of, of coloured light coming in and impinging on the door, or on the wall, I beg your pardon. Um, and that's the sort of thing we'd have seen if we were back in the early days uh, of the cathedral with its first stained glass windows. There are new windows uh, going in all around the cathedral. Um, in fact, um, well, I'll leave you to decide uh, where these are. Um, it's, um, I beg your pardon, uh, it's fairly easy to tell, but have a trick trip into Canterbury Cathedral and go hunting for these. I'll give you a hint. Uh, they're in the cloisters. Um, it's not a very big hint. You can pretty much see uh, that, um, that this is a cloister that we're in. But this is really up to date, only a few years old um, glass art that's been put in there. And again, you can see 
um, although we've got a basic color glass as our background we've got some incredibly detailed and extraordinarily executed um, painting going on on top of that glass um, it's amazing stuff and that's what these windows look like from the outside there's one there's the other nothing much at all again we need that transmitted light to give us the effect so here's uh, here's those windows windows again um, and again you can see where I've sourced those pictures with uh, with permission uh, and these were installed in 2018 so not very long ago go and have a look they're well worth a visit Uh, well, since I make no money out of this, I don't think this counts as advertising, but um, I was um, quite privileged to act as advisor to this um, young person's guide to um, stained glass windows in the cathedral, a book called Paintings in Light. It's, it's, a, it's a very readable book um, written by uh, my um, very good friend Martin Barr. Uh, and here's Leonie again, the head of the glass studios, who was obviously instrumental in putting this team together. All I did was provide a little bit of scientific advice. Stained glass is still the subject of a lot of research. There's a lot of activity still in trying to understand how the glass was made um, in the first place and how it's changed uh, over time. So this is work um, undertaken by a chap called Ian Freestone, who's um, got a research group at the University, uh, University College London. And he's been looking, for instance, at um, copper in old glass uh, and noticing that uh, the copper of often isn't uniformly distributed. And one of the things that's happened, and, and this is fairly common it seems, uh, is that um, coloured glass will be reused. So it will be put into um, a furnace, remelted, mixed with other materials uh, in order to produce um, um, glass for new windows. So it will be recycled in other words, and in that process one can get all sorts of strange things happening uh, if it doesn't mix fully. Um, so we get all sorts of striations, for instance, in our coloured glass. Uh, actually, I think it adds to the interest uh, of stained glass windows to see this, but actually understanding it has required um, quite a lot of very sophisticated scientific research. Stained glass has been around, of course, uh, for a long time and still is being used. This is a, um, a piece of garden sculpture that um, involves using um, coloured glass and painted glass panels. I took this picture um, at um, uh, Wisley, the Royal Horticultural Society Gardens. Uh, they had an art exhibition up there a few years ago. Uh, and there were quite a few pieces that involved using glassware. Uh, but we can go way back. So, you know, this I think is Victorian. Uh, it's in the Sunderland Museum of Glass. Uh, well worth a visit if you get up there. Um, the National Museum of Glass is nearby, so you could have a, a double hit, as it were. But, you know, someone in the past wove and then tied a bow tie using glass fibres. Um, so essentially this is a, um, uh, a glass wool woven bow tie here. And there are more modern pieces. Um, this is a glass bubble dress, or a dress made of glass bubbles, I should say. Um, in deference to the safety of the model wearing this, uh, the glass uh, baubles were all, I think, coated in um, a polymer and a plastic before they were attached to the fabric to create this dress. But there we are. Um, glass can be used in, um, in fashion as well as in art. 
and in architecture. And I've chosen a very um, silly example of this. This is um, uh, a screenshot taken from the computer game Minecraft, um, something my grandsons had to teach me to play. So, um, you know, here's my little avatar here standing on a glass balcony which sits out from the side of a very glass heavy uh, construction that I built for myself um, in our little world on uh, on a computer server but of course we know what glass looks like in architecture uh, you know we've all got um, we've all got windows so that's it we have finished with video three thank you for watching and when you're ready come back and we'll um, We'll explore a little further um, when we get to part four and included in that we'll look at some use of um, glass in engineering uh, for instance and in aspects of technology. So I'll see you next time. Bye for now.